you know that Shakespeare, which last year canceled six or eight performances, canceled upwards of 24. Um, there are ramifications far beyond Shakespeare. Brit had similar experiences. Um, our tourism industry was hard hit. Um, and that means money out of the pockets of those of us who live here in Southern Oregon. So our next panel is going to address what the economic consequences of smoke and fire are. Uh, and to give us some ideas about resources that may be available to local businesses and how we can all come together um, to build, frankly, the word of the day, a more resilient local economy. And I want to introduce Bill Thorndike, who's the moderator of this panel. Oops, where's my, where's my sage? <laughs> Here we go. Um, actually, all of you know Bill, or many of you do. Bill operates his family business, Medford Fabrication, which is a custom metals fabrication company that has been in operation for 75 years. He currently serves, and this is just what he currently serves on, um, the boards of SOU Board of Trustees, the Southern Oregon Regional Economic Development Inc., Oregon Business Council, Regents Oregon Blue Cross Blue Shield, the Crater Lake National Park Trust, Oregon Economic Forum, Jefferson Regional Health Alliance, Philanthropy Northwest, whew, Cascade Siskiyou Fund, and the Northwest Health Foundation. Um, someone who certainly knows our business community backwards and forwards and has for many years. Bill, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. As I was thinking about this and really the economic development impact uh, of the smoke, and, and the fires, of course. Um, I remember back to uh, the most famous quote from the Supreme Court from Justice Potter Stewart in 1964. He was talking about obscenity, and he said, you know, I know it when I see it. And I think we're kind of in that same realm here, and I'm very pleased with the panelists we have today, because you're going to hear about what's happening around economic changes, development, opportunities, uh, at, at, at the root level, at the floor level here. Um, having served on the Federal Reserve uh, Board of San Francisco, uh, of course you're always faced with the macro macroeconomic picture and then also the labor economic picture, which is really talking about people. The reality is we know that having the fires that we have in our region, the ultimate, ultimate economic impact at a macro level might actually be positive with all the hundreds of millions of dollars that are actually spent on fighting fires. And so it's going to be very interesting uh, for Guy Power to look at the economic impact um, on a, at a labor basis uh, later uh, this summer or this fall when you think of, again, the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been dislocated from ticket sales or from rafting trips or from whatever to where we are today. So I'm very pleased to have a panel for us to at least will give us some idea of what are we doing relative to the economic impact and what can we do better as we go forward. So I'm pleased to have on our panel today Alex Campbell, who is the Southern Oregon Regional Solutions Coordinator with the Office of Governor Kate Brown. Uh, Alex previously was Executive Director of the Partnership for Economic Development in Douglas County, so he has a good perspective, again, as to what the fires created in that area. He also led uh, um, resource and economic development efforts in the city of Milwaukee in Clackamas County. Uh, prior to moving to Oregon, he was a faculty research associate at the University of Maryland and performed public policy research for several small think tanks. He holds a master's degree of public policy. We're pleased, pleased to have Janet Soto Rodriguez, is an entrepreneurship strategist and part of the innovation and entrepreneurship team at Business Oregon, where she develops and manages statewide partnerships for assistance to entrepreneurs at every stage and is leading the Rural Opportunity Initiative, which is focused on growing entrepreneurship in rural communities across Oregon. Prior to this role, Janet served as the Economic and Business Equity Policy Advisor to Governor Kate Brown. Next is our own Sandra Siley, who has been the Executive Director of the Ashland Chamber of Commerce since 1985, creating innovative program projects that have been used as models by other cities to develop tourism programs, business development projects, and cooperative community relationships. She has served as a member and past president of the Southern Oregon Visitors Association, 
Southern Oregon University's Regional Advisory Board, SOU President's Advisory Council, and the National Community Hospital Foundation, and as a member of the SOU Foundation. And we're very pleased to have our fourth panelist who uh, made it from Pendleton down here, uh, Todd Davidson. Uh, Todd has been involved with the Oregon Tourism uh, Office since 1996 in 2004 with a reworking of uh, that into Travel Oregon. Uh, Todd became the CEO of, of that body. So uh, again, uh, you know the drill. We're going to give each of these folks an opportunity to give a perspective on the economic impact of the smoke and the fire, and then we'll wrap up with some questions. So we'll start with you, Alex. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, th thank you very much to Representative Marsh for uh, inviting uh, the, our office, our Office of Governor Keith Brown, to be here. Um, the governor's uh, vision for prosperity for all of Oregon. Um, not just the metro area, I think, is, is very clear and reflected in Business Oregon's strategic plan. Um, I've been involved with her directly in conversations with Oregon Shakespeare Festival and also uh, visits to Taylor Creek Fire. Um, we're very concerned about you know what, what the immediate impacts and, and long-term impacts of, of this new fire environment are, particularly on, on the Rogue Valley. So um, I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit about some actions that we've taken already, um, and then also uh, explore some of the directions where what, what we might do as a community, as a region, um, to, to go beyond sort of the immediate reaction to the immediate impacts. Um, I, I, work for the, I work for the state, but I'm based here in, in the Rogue Valley and, and work with um, our regional economic development partners, uh, including so ready. Uh, Colleen Padilla, their, their director, was sorry that she couldn't be here today, but I um, might share with you a little bit of, of their perspective and some of, some of what they're, they're doing as well. So first, I, I want to acknowledge, um, I, I don't, I, as an economic development professional, I think we often don't acknowledge that we have limited ability. You know, the, the economy is very large. Economic development is a, a very uh, small part of it. Um, so I think the, some of the similarities between the, the first panel and this panel are interesting. You know, we're, we're going to have to be very strategic and look at where the, where, where the places are that we can, can have an effect. Um, and, I, and when we think about the, the overall impact on, on the Rogue Valley economy, um, as Bill said, there, there, there are multiple impacts of, of the fires. So there are additional, um, additional monies that have flowed into the region. When you look at how, when the work Travel Oregon did on last summer's uh, uh, fire impacts, you saw a lot less impact on lodging and hospitality because there are a lot of federal and other workers coming into these communities to fight the fire. Um, other operators, um, other pieces of the economy are hit much more heavily and negatively. And um, we've got some of the fine grain detail on that currently on this year, in part because we are reaching out to the uh, Small Business Administration. Hopefully, in, in, uh, within a couple weeks, we will, they will have declared the, the, the impact of the, the fires um, set off by the July 15th lightning strikes were significant enough that they need to put in uh, place economic uh, disaster lending. Um, and I've talked to a number of businesses that are anxiously awaiting that. They need that. Um, they, they've, um, they're a lot, a, sort of 25 to 30 percent down is, is what we're hearing from a, a lot of different businesses. Um, and particularly those with the, with the Taylor Creek fire, the closure of, the, of Rogue River to recreation has really severely impacted uh, some of those operators. And as, as Bill mentioned, you know, the, the impact here, um, the impact here to Oregon Shakespeare Festival and the spillover effects on, on uh, Ashland visitation um, have been really significant. Um, so to immediately address those individual business impacts, um, we, we do want to see that disaster lending put in place. Um, we, the SPDC is uh, our Small Business Development Center network. Um, those folks are, are available and are working with businesses and to help them both deal with planning and addressing how they, how they move forward and, and, and how they might um, uh, seek 
financing to, if, the, if that's the right choice for them. Similarly, the state um, Department of Business and Consumer Services, their insurance folks, um, we've been putting them in touch, businesses in touch with them as they struggle to deal with whatever uh, insurance coverage they might have that would help them get through um, situations. Our, our workforce system has also been reaching out to employers and, and helping them uh, helping them either remain engaged with their employees if they had to lay them off or get their, get those folks um, in, into the, uh, in, so they're aware of the services that they are available for them. But that's all pretty reactive. And so what, what, are, what are we going to do sort of more, uh, more thoughtfully about what, what, the, uh, what we can do in the future? The governor appointed a couple of recovery councils last year, one in response to Chetco Bar Fire, one in response to the Gorge Fire. Um, and one of, the, one of those each developed a number of recommendations, one of which was that we need some funding to support, support planning projects for communities to address disasters. So we now have the Local Economic Opportunity Fund. I'm sure Sandra and, um, and Todd will talk a little bit about some of the market research that we need to do, but we, we think that there, there is an opportunity for the state to support uh, research that would help our visitation economy understand how they might adapt, what, what has been the impact on, on the sort of viewpoint of their customers. Um, and we've, we've got a number, a number of tools that, as I said, they're, they're not, they're, not um, they're fairly small in, in respect to the shape of the larger economy. But we do have uh, tools to support particular um, financing, um, re business recruitment, um, the uh, startup, startup business. Uh, the, the, I think we've done a very good job of aligning workforce with economic development here in the Rogue Valley. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we, um, and we also have a number of other tools that, that we can bring to the table. The, the um, Oregon Consensus and the Oregon Solutions uh, Directors at the National Policy Consensus Center at PSU were actually here just this past week talking about how their support of this collaborative kind of decision making, again, a parallel <coughs> me to that first panel. Um, we've got some structures that we can really support um, a, a community as, as, we, as we look at what might be the appropriate medium and, and long term response. Um, there are adaptations to the recreation economy, the visitation economy, but there's also what what do what does our overall economic development plan look like in the context where, frankly, we've I think been some not reliant uh, is maybe not the right term, but um, it's been a, a, a source of comfort I think overall for the the economic view for this valley that. The, the wine industry and other visitation has been sort of a, 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 a tailwind, and what does it what does it mean if, if that's less true in the future? Um, and I think I think appropriately so ready is the organization that you know, or one of the organizations that really needs to be at the at the heart of that discussion. There are there are our federal economic development district. There's there's support from the federal government to to think about these kinds of things. In a, in a strategic way, um, and uh, so Ray's brought it brought in a, a really first class um, team, or looking at a, a group called TIP out of Austin, <coughs> Seattle, to, to help us think about what are those strategic initiatives, what, what are additional um, competitive advantages that, that we want to leverage going forward, um, and and a few things in, in that area. Jan, Jan's going to talk about entrepreneurship. We already have. Um, I think a real strength in terms of the uh, angel investment community here um, that's, that's been brought together. Um, there's uh, software development. There's, there's a company here in Ashland that we've been working with lately that's talking about a really significant expansion. I think we've really only scratched the surface on, on ways we might be able to leverage this institution, SOU, um, to support the, that kind of uh, diversification and support of new and emerging industries. Um, and finally, I, 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 at the at the base, though, any any activity, any any strategy is um, we do need an attractive region. We do need a a, a, a good place to live, um, not just for the economy, but um, for for 
for uh, fulfilling lives for, for all of us. So, um, you know, we, we are ready to, to play our part in, in the, the conversation that the first panelists talked about and, and, and what it is that we need to do in, in changing our forest management. And again, I think that, that is an economic development issue. Um, and, and just to touch a little bit more on that, the, the first panel suggested there, there are some economic opportunities that, that could come from that, right? We, we, are, we have been having less economic activity in our forests um, over the last couple of decades, right, than previously, and a reversal of that would, could be a real positive driver. Um, and I think we're, we're also very lucky to have the mill, the mill infrastructure that we do. You know, that's going to be an important part of, of what that solution is. And so we've got some really, uh, we're fortunate to still have those assets the way a lot of, a lot of regions in, in the West don't. Um, so uh, I look forward to, uh, you know, I think we've got an opportunity to recommit and, and, and work with some more intentionality in the future about, as a community, as what our economic future looks like. Thank you. So as Bill mentioned, I am part of the innovation and entrepreneurship team at Business Oregon, um, and I am spearheading our Rural Opportunity Initiative. And just to give you a little bit of more clarity, it is a grant that is meant to infuse dollars in local communities and local initiatives to increase uh, the amount of entrepreneurs and small businesses in the community. And to Alex's point, it really focuses on diversification. How can we look at who we are, look at our strengths, look at our assets, and then rethink ourselves? Think outside the box, color outside the lines, and completely say, what are we not looking at? What are we not thinking about? And really infusing ourselves with innovation and thinking about different industries. So outside of OSF and outside of tourism, what else can we do? Because innovation and technology means that we can really be whoever we want to be. And so the initiative focuses on that. But before I get too deep into this, and Representative Marsh invited me here today to talk about the work I'm doing with other rural communities, just to give you an example of what some of these creative out-of-the-box strategies could look like for you, I want to introduce somebody in the audience that's really important. Um, she is your local regional development officer for Business Oregon, so whereas I cover the entire state, you have somebody here locally who's dedicated to you, and anything that I mentioned today, any resources, a lot of what Alex talked about, um, a lot of those on-the-ground programs and initiatives and dollars are actually run out of our agency. And so if you want information on any of that, um, Marta in the audience is a great person. So can you stand up? So remember her, find her, get her card, make sure that you all are in contact. Um, and she'll help me answer questions after this, I'm sure. Um, so a little bit about uh, the grant, a little bit about how it's designed, um, just so that you understand. We really focus on what is a local challenge. I think in this room we all are here because we've identified the challenge. Um, and then we really look at what are some grassroots and community organizing activities to really galvanize the community around a shared purpose. What you are doing here today is already a phenomenal first step. I had no idea how many people were going to show up today. And that this many people are here trying to identify what comes next is already a tremendous um, asset. Then we also look at what are some flexible and adaptable strategies and how do we infuse that with marketing specialists, uh, facilitators, uh, direct grant writing, and we really couple this initiative with a lot of hands-on support and coaching. And I get to be really lucky and wake up and travel all over Oregon and be the coach to a number of communities. Um, and so I always wonder, how did I get so lucky? Um, and how did I, you know, how do I wake up and get to do this every day? I've been in Coos Bay, in uh, Medford, Central Point, Klamath Falls this week alone, and next week I'm headed over to Harding County. And the, the theme is for me that my purpose, and what makes me wake up every day is that I've seen hard economic times. I grew up in a small remote village in the mountains, no running water, no electricity, certainly no connectivity, no roads, and I saw firsthand what the power of community and grassroots organizing can do to change the community, to redesign who you are, to change the way people think about you, and to say, we have a lot more to offer. And so Business Oregon gave me the chance uh, to design something that is really meant for communities to, to raise their hand and say, 
we want to think about who else we can be too. Um, so from isolation, lack of resources, stripping down to the bare essentials, you really have an opportunity to discover who you are. And Ashland, um, not to mitigate the summer that you've had or the last two or three years, because it's been hard. And I'm telling you, I've been the last 24 hours walking around just talking to strangers, and a lot of people are like looking at me like, why are you asking me these questions? <laughs> um, and I just wanted to check in with local folks and see how they're feeling. And it's heavy. And and everyone is talking about it. It didn't matter who I talked to, they had an opinion. And sometimes I sat for way longer than I anticipated listening to somebody. Um, and the truth is that despite this, despite this onset of literal darkness, you all have a tremendous amount of assets, a tremendous amount of strength, and a tremendous amount of local pride. And this room is evidence of that in and of itself and we can build on this. When I go to communities, sometimes I go into a room and there's three people. And I'm like, we can still build on this. <laughs> and so what you will have here, we can really build on this. So with that said, you all have a challenge. You have a shared purpose. And as Val said from the last panel, we're in this together. So um, at Rep Marsh's request, I'm just going to go through and share with you some of the things I've seen this week alone. Um, and I'm happy to go over a number of other strategies, um, but these are just offered um, to give you some context of how you can think outside the box. So earlier this week, I was in Coos Bay, and I said, all right, what's your challenge? And they said, we have identified three. Workforce, lack of affordable childcare, and housing. All right, and then they actually had somebody come in, one of our facilitators, through this grant, who discovered that Coos Bay is a childcare desert, and that they actually have 12 slots for every 100 children that need one. So huge, huge issue. And I had the Small Business Development Center, local chambers, like all these business support groups, and they're saying, well, we don't do childcare, and well, how do we tackle this problem? And they went around and they really ultimately got 18 major partners, they identified one champion in the community college, the community college had an abandoned building that DHS recently left. They had close to $2 million in uh, money that they had from being under budget from refurbishing uh, their health sciences building, which was, I mean, talk about like an opportunity. Um, and they got these 18 partners, and similar to uh, what Mark Webb said from the first forestry panel, sometimes these are groups of people who couldn't stand each other. Um, we, they also had the two tribes in the room, and they got all 18 partners to pool their money, pool their resources, share their strategic plans. This didn't happen overnight. I've been working there for two years. So they got them all to come together, and now they have you know close to $3 million in, in pooled resources, an empty building, everybody co-locating. They've identified their shared challenges. They have a shared purpose. And now they're so energized and the community is so inspired. And this is a community that's been hit for a very long time. And they're saying, we're going to build the first child care incubator in the United States. Wow. In Coos Bay, right? Like, <laughs> whoa. And they have the resources to do it. And they have the expertise. And they have the community college. So they're going to put their business school to work there, their culinary school to provide food, the child care and human development and education branches of education. They also have their adult workforce co-located in this building, as well as all the small business coaching services, their chamber, their economic development district, their small business development centers, and the two tribes all in one building, all because they know that these are their three biggest challenges, and they've had enough, and they want to shock the world. They want to become, it will be the second child care incubator. The first one is in Australia, and they're saying, we can do it in Coos Bay, and they have the momentum to do it. So that's one where you think about challenge and shared purpose. Another, oh yeah. So another one is Klamath Falls. I'll run through this one really quick too. Um, they wanted to keep graduates, uh, diversify their economy, and they said, what is our biggest untapped resource? And how do we address keeping young people here? Oh, our young people. Why don't we ask our young people? So they put the power in the hands of young people. They actually created a challenge called Innovation Close to Home. And these young people were like, whoa, you trust us. We're going to go out and do this. 
They went out and met with farmers. They addressed barley as an economy that's been failing for the or falling for the last 20 years. And after one session with farmers, these young people created a 85% return on their investment. They addressed growing challenges, harvesting challenging, and storing challenges. And I was thinking about what Jackson said about the, the breath masks or the respirators. I was like, that sounds like a really inefficient thing that exists. And in Klamath Falls, these young people identified eight new inventions to address some of the region's biggest problems related to harvesting, bees, pollination, and the community was like, oh my god, all we had to do was give them a sandbox. Let them break them, let them play. What if you told young people here that they need to come up with the next new respirator? They would probably be all over that, and I bet that you could get it after one or two summers in the same way that Climate Falls. They've been doing that now for five years, and the winning team from their competition has graduated, has stayed in Climate Falls, and all of them have opened a local business. So it's working. Um, say is that you all have a lot of momentum, a lot of energy. Uh, you all know what your challenge is. You all can galvanize around a lot of support. You have underutilized assets. You have young people. You can look at new industries. You can do pop-up maker spaces, pop-up robotic competitions. I'm doing this right now in 18 communities across Oregon. And there are some where they're like, the chamber was like, we can't get anybody to come out to anything. And at the end of the day, after working with them for three months, they had a room, not this full, but it was 40, 50 people. Same thing in Klamath Falls, just two days ago, close to 200 people in a room, and they were talking for the first time about guns, sexuality, religion, things that they weren't willing to talk about, but it was because they tapped into all their underutilized resources and are rethinking who they are. So um, you all have a really tremendous space here, and um, you can do amazing work here too. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Pam, for organizing the summit and for your concern on this complex and very challenging issue. And it's my pleasure to share with you some ongoing programs and collaborative relationships that we've developed at the Ashland Chamber and we continue to grow. And I really appreciate the question, how do we build resilience in a business environment that is facing ongoing smoke and fire concerns? First, it's a question that's based in a practical approach, assuming we will continue to have smoke and fire that affect our communities and that we have the capacity to do something about it. And while that might seem obvious, I think a normal reaction to the situation that we've all experienced is, I sure hope that doesn't happen again, or phew, we're through the worst of it. Um, let's just not worry too much about the future. But we know that's not a good idea, and we prefer a positive, proactive approach. So we've asked ourselves, what do we have control over? And what do we not have control over? Where can we find information? And how do we distribute it? How can we collaborate? And who should we collaborate with? And where can we then turn to work on long-term solutions to the problem? The Ashland Chamber has a Fire Prevention Task Force, and this is in collaboration with the City of Ashland's Ashland Fire and Rescue, and it includes members of Allison Lurch and Chris Chambers over on the wall. Say hi. Um, it includes the Wildfire um, Mitigation Commission of the City, the Chamber Board, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the County Health Department, thank you Jackson, and Asante, Ashland Community Hospital. And our purpose has been to work on issues of fire and smoke in our community, as well as emergency preparedness. And this has included sponsorship of community forums, films, lectures, and printed materials to better educate our community on fire and smoke. Two different community events we helped sponsor with Paul Hesburgh on the Arab megafires. And some of you may have attended that. Raise your hand if you went to any of those. They're fantastic. Whenever you have the opportunity to hear Paul Hesburgh speak, please do that. We 
realized after the smoke of last summer and the negative impact we had uh, to our business community in our region that our task force had a job ahead of it. And so we met last fall and we decided we needed to help our businesses mitigate the possibility of smoke in the future. We certainly didn't anticipate the kind of summer we ended up having this year and the severe economic impacts that we've experienced regionally. What we did when we got together is we found out there was really um, a lack of resources. And you think, well, there's resources everywhere. But if you recall, it was really difficult to know where to go, where to find answers. And so we, we didn't even really understand. We looked at the DEQ chart and said, well, what exactly does that mean, unhealthy for sensitive groups? Who's sensitive? Who isn't? Um, and what happens over prolonged exposure? What does that all mean? And we, we also said, how can we improve our indoor environments? If, like the previous panelists have said, our health and uh, professionals, you need to stay indoors, well, what is indoors? How do we know it's healthy indoors? Um, so we, we did a lot of research, and, and really thanks to the work of our Ashland Fire and Rescue and Allison and Chris, a uh, tremendous amount of data that we were able to uncover um, and we learned things that we never really knew about before. We learned about MERV 13 air filters and air scrubbers and air cleaners. Um, the difference, what's an air curtain? What, do, what does all this mean? And how can we look at those particular equipment improvements in our businesses to improve the indoor air quality? And this was important. It was important for our employees who work day in and day out and certainly for the customers, people who come into those businesses, to feel that it's, it's a safe environment. We created, and we said, all right, we need to educate people. So we put on a workshop, like we all do. And in February, we had um, a terrific turnout. And we did a workshop all on smoke awareness. We had representation from Southern Oregon University the school district, the YMCA, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and a number of small businesses. And in that, we also uh, created videos, and we had how to wear a mask. Uh, again, recognizing we didn't really know that we were doing it wrong. And what kind of equipment, what kind of filters, etc. And then after the workshop, we took all of that information, created a second set of videos so people could go directly and watch them if they couldn't go to um, the workshop themselves. We uh, were really happy to have the support of the Nature Conservancy and the U.S. Forest Service uh, with a perfect grant that we were able to also make that all happen. We updated our website, Ashland Fire and Rescue updated theirs. We put all these videos and materials and articles all about smoke and fire. And then we said, you know what, let's combine those and let's create one website. And that's how we developed smokewiseashland.org. Just um, last week, uh, this last week, Allison shared with us in July alone, that website had 17,000 hits. And that was in July. So we know that it was um, very well used. One of the things that we did was, during our workshop, we created this smoke preparedness guide. And basically, it's a needs analysis for someone to take a look at their physical plant, what does it currently look like, and look at their employees who could come to work in a severe smoke situation and who couldn't, and what do their customers look like? Could they continue to do business or not? Um, additionally, we provided information on specific air cleaners, air filters, etc., and also some strategies around a communication plan. So, so if we did get in a situation, they would know what to do. Um, we were very happy that Southern Oregon University took the recommendations and made changes and improved the air quality of some of their buildings. And then when we had the situation, of course, um, they were able to open some of their facilities to the community, which was terrific. The school district also took our recommendations, implemented changes, and then in the, in the situation that we had with the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, they were able to collaborate with them and utilize the theater. While not ideal, it certainly provided a wonderful resource, and thanks to our school district for doing that. Our YMCA, again, 
it made improvements to their air quality inside, so that was terrific. We took that information and we realized everything we'd done for business owners was scalable, and certainly um, citizens could look at their own homes in the same way. And so we continued to update the website and with the work of the Ashland Fire and Rescue, um, provided that as a resource so citizens could say, you know, I, I can buy an air cleaner for my home, it's portable, and I can feel assured that if I do have to stay indoors, that the air inside is clean. We all learn that we also need to take a look at all of our systems internally and our, our filters, such as the MERV 13. We've been promoting the use of this site all over um, throughout the summer. We have emailed our community partners who shared it. Asante shared it with every one of their employees, including physicians who are sharing information with their patients. Um, SOU shared it with all of their employees, and it's, it's, we're really pushing out education information. We've looked at our smoke resources um, and communication and provided updates within all of our materials for our visitors uh, and people who live here. I was able to speak, um, um, Pam had invited us to speak at the Oregon State Capitol to the Economic Development and Trade Committee to share with them what we've done here because we want to share it with anyone who, who wants to use it. The um, state of Washington has taken our information and they're using it. Other communities are, are using it across the country through the work that Allison does with fire adapted communities. We, um, we very much support the work of the Rogue Basin Strategy, bringing community leaders in the entire region together to work on smoke mitigation, to talk about what successes we've had and how we can, and the need for strong partnerships in our region. We are working with our local, regional, and state partners and tourism entities such as Travel Southern Oregon and Travel Oregon, our businesses, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and we're taking a look at seasonal shifts in business and what would that look like. Um, as Alex mentioned, we're, we've met, we're to continue to meet on how do we research our current visitor base to look for seasonal opportunities, and how do we collaborate on a regional sharing of data, visitor promotions and communications, and what could that look like that's different than it has in the past. We need to share the same message of care for our environment, stories of those who have worked to mitigate smoke, efforts to manage our forests, and improve fire danger. And why this is still a really great place to live and do business. We all need to own the problem, work collabor collaboratively on solutions, and we're finding success by doing that, and we can find more success than we need to. After all, we're breathing in the same air. Let's recognize we need to breathe out workable solutions. Thank you. Well, good. I guess I'll say good afternoon. I can see the clock, and it's just a little after 12, so I'll say good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Todd Davidson, and I have the privilege and pleasure of serving as the CEO of Travel Oregon, and I, I feel like I'm kind of chasing Janet around the state lately. I was Pacific City on Tuesday, it was Pendleton Wednesday and Thursday, and it's Ashland Friday and Saturday, um, and that's important. Uh, because, uh, as, as Janet expressed, it's incredibly invaluable for us to be able to uh, be meeting with folks across the state, hearing firsthand what, what the challenges are and also what the opportunities are as well. I want to personally thank Representative Marsh for bringing us all together here for this very timely summit. Uh, this, uh, this is a situation, as, as we all know, and has been expressed, I, I think, very, very well by the, by the first panel that is not going to pivot overnight. And so uh, resiliency and adaptation are obviously the two key things that I'm hearing resonate throughout this day. The other thing I want to be sure I point out uh, is that as I, as I um, leave from Ashland, you've got great resources here. Uh, first and foremost, you've already heard from Sandra. So for those of you that are here in Ashland, you know the amazing work that they're doing. I also want to call out Brad Niva, who is the executive director of the Travel Southern Oregon organization, our partner here on the regional level. Brad, if you would stand, I'm going to call you out, just so people know who you are. But this is a gentleman that we work with, he and his organization at Travel Southern Oregon, that we work with very closely on uh, wild, these wildfire communication issues, but also marketing and tourism development issues as well. 
As Travel Oregon, we're involved on the preventative side, the, the during the wildfire side, and the recovery side. And I want to just go through uh, a few of the initiatives very quickly because I've put a sheet, a one pager, back over here on this first table by the door that's called Resources for the Travel and Tourism Industry that highlight far more all the various uh, tools in the toolkit that are available for you. So let me start there. One that touches all of them is this wildfire toolkit that we've pulled together. It's a, it's a web page that contains our industry partners and stakeholders with all the wildfire resources that we believe that they will need, including the wildfire economic impact study that we did last year that um, was able to estimate that there was about a $51 million economic impact to the state's tourism industry as a result of the wildfires that occurred last year. That information is available on our industry website, which is industry.traveloregon.com. And again, that website's on that resource page that I mentioned earlier. Uh, secondly, I'd like to mention that this coordination with our partners, I mentioned Brad, I mentioned uh, the work with Sandra, you know, we're involved in a number of coordination calls with a variety of partners to make sure that tourism industry impacts are being evaluated and being communicated across multiple platforms. This includes the work that we're doing with the Western States Tourism Recovery Coalition. In other words, we're working with our partners in California and Washington to make sure our visitors are getting first-hand information about what's happening in each of the states up and down the West Coast because that tends to be how they're inclined to travel. Uh, we're also involved in a natural disaster marketing co-op, but uh, this is where Travel Oregon has brought some money to the table to match dollars that are brought forward from regional destination marketing organizations like Brad's work with Travel Southern Oregon. I'm very proud to tell you that Travel Southern Oregon was the first one to raise their hand and get to the table and say, we need to do something, and we've got about a $50,000 marketing co-op in the works uh, to, uh, to get in place this fall. And the fourth is, I just want to mention that we have just recently completed a wildfire video. Uh, we put together a video to provide some context and background on wildfires in Oregon, to clarify misconceptions about wildfires in general, and to make sure we're providing visitors with a call to action to visit these communities that have been impacted by wildfires once, once the wildfires have <coughs> subsided. So with that, I will conclude and, and uh, turn it back over to you, Bill, to. Uh, open it up for the panel for questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Great. Thanks, thanks, Brian. Uh, we want to honor the commitment that we made um, uh, as to how this uh, conference was uh, scheduled for today. And so um, we're going to forego the questions to the panel at, at this point, and I hope that many of you, if you have questions specific uh, to this area, can stick around afterwards. But we do have one more panel, and it's on climate mitigation and adaptation. And uh, we have uh, two great panelists and, and, and Sean to introduce that. So I think, uh, again, um, Pam, if it's okay with you, we're going to just transition uh, directly uh, to uh, our last two panelists and, and, and our moderator uh, before you wrap up this great morning. <laughs>